So the sutta tonight is called the Sabasawa Sutta and it's called All the Distractions. And I changed some words around. So it's going to, it says taints here, but I don't like the word taints because it doesn't have a lot of meaning to us these days. So I call it distractions. Thus have I heard on one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Sawati in Jetta's Grove, Anathan Pandika's Park. There he addressed the monks thus. Monks, venerable sir, they replied, the Blessed One said this. Monks, I shall teach you a discourse on the restraint of all the distractions. Have you noticed any distractions today? <laughs> this is the hardest day of the retreat, I promise. It gets easier as time goes by. Listen and attend closely to what I shall say, yes, venerable sir, the monks replied. The blessed one said this. Monks, I, sh I say that the destruction of the distractions is for one who knows and sees, not for one who does not know and see, who knows and sees what? That's fine. Wise attention and unwise attention. What does that mean, wise attention? There's a lot of interpretations of this. Wise attention means using your mindfulness so you can see how mind's attention moves. Anytime you hear the word wise or wisdom in Buddhism, it is referring to the links of dependent origination. Now, I talked about that yesterday. I didn't necessarily tell you what it was. But a feeling arises, pleasant, painful, neither painful nor pleasant. Craving arises right after that. I like it, I don't like it, mind. Tension and tightness, that's how you recognize it in your head, around your brain. You feel that. Right after that, all of your thoughts, all of your opinions, all of your ideas and story about why you don't like this situation, whatever it happens to be. Now, when I'm talking about feeling, either pleasant feeling or painful feeling, I'm not just talking about physical painful or pleasant feeling, but it's both physical and mental. Okay, so after you get done with your stories, then your emotional attachments and habitual tendencies start to come up. Now you're made up of five things. This whole psychophysical process is made up of five things. You have a physical body. You have feelings. Pleasant, painful, neither painful nor pleasant. You have perception. Perception is a part of the mind that names things. When it's a pleasant feeling that arises, your mind says that's pleasant. Okay, or if it's a painful feeling, it says painful. Perception names things. You look at this, your mind says, that's a book. Why? Because you know what books are. You, that has memory in it. Then you have thoughts, and then you have consciousness. Now, what happens, especially when a painful, either mental or physical pain arises, is we try to control that feeling with our thoughts. And that doesn't work. But it is a habitual tendency. 
We try to control by thinking these pleasant or unpleasant feelings, holding on to the pleasant feelings, pushing away the unpleasant feelings. And the more we get caught up in thinking about, the more suffering you have. So, what's a distraction? Any kind of thought that you get involved with and take it personally. A painful feeling arises, let's say, in your knee. Did you ask that painful feeling to arise? Did you say, you know, I haven't had a painful feeling in my knee for a while, I might as well have it now. No, it happens because conditions are right for it to arise. What you do with what arises in the present moment dictates what happens in the future. When you get caught up in trying to think that feeling away, oh, I hate that feeling, I wish it would stop. Every thought about that feeling makes that feeling bigger and more intense. So what to do? Any ideas? Oh, thank you. <laughs> Use the six R's. Why? Because when you use the six R's and you let go of that craving, you don't have any thoughts in your mind. Your mind is clear. Your mind is bright. You're not being a second-hand observer. You're being a first-hand observer. And then you bring up a wholesome thing for your mind to be on. Smile. Then return to your object of meditation. That's very wholesome. You're bringing this clear, pure mind back to your object of meditation. It doesn't matter how many times your mind gets pulled back to that sensation or that emotion, whatever it happens to be. It doesn't matter. Your job is to recognize that that distraction is there. Now this is any of the five hindrances. I talked about the five hindrances last night. Every one of those is a distraction. Why? Because it pulls your attention away from your object to meditation. And every hindrance has the false belief that this is me, this is mine, this is who I am. And that is a false belief because when you use the six R's, your mind is clear and you're not identifying with it, you're seeing it as this is part of a process. You're not taking it personally. Any time you have repeat thoughts, it's just like it was on a tape deck. Same thought, same order, all the way through. And generally the same criticism to yourself and the same pain. The reason that that arose was because whatever happened in the past to make that arise, you identified with, you took it personally, and that is suffering. That is the cause of suffering with that craving arising, the I like it, I don't like it mind. I did something in the past. It wasn't very good, in my opinion. 
So I'm going to beat myself up and keep repeating over and over again what a nasty person I am because I did that. And then you start believing it after a while. And it's not necessarily true. What you have to do is say, yes, it's there. You can't push it away. You can't stop it from coming up. When a painful feeling comes up, it's there whether you like it or not. But instead of trying to control that painful feeling or make it be different or change it so it doesn't hurt so much, you're doing that all with your habitual tendency of trying to control everything with your mind and taking it personally and identifying this is me, this is mine. And you are the person that's causing your own suffering. You can't blame anybody else for your suffering. You cause it yourself. Why? Because you're taking it personally. I don't like it. I don't want that to be there. I'm going to try to force it away by thinking other things. But you always come back and you get caught up. And that hindrance gets to be bigger and bigger. Now, the only way that really works is by using the six R's. And the six R's are part of the Eightfold Path. And we'll get into the Eightfold Path later. It's part of right effort. That's what it is. When I talk about uh, the Eightfold Path, I, I use different words than most people are used to hearing. But they call it right effort. I call it harmonious practice because that's what this is. That's what this meditation is all about. It's learning to be in harmony with things, not trying to control, not trying to push them away, not trying to make them different than they are, but being in harmony and allowing it to be. This is how this practice is immediately effective. It works. It works the first time you do the six R's. It worked. Why? Because you let go of that craving. You purified your mind. You brought that purified mind back to your object of meditation. So, I'd call that effective, wouldn't you? So what I'm t talking about right now is the links of dependent origination. This is how this process works. I don't care what country you're from. As long as you're a human being, it works exactly the same for everyone. That's one of the brilliance of the Buddha. He saw that everybody is the same. Well, you have different experiences and all of that sort of thing, of course. But, in a fundamental way, this is how mind works. And he spent a long time figuring this out. So any kind of distraction that arises, any kind of repeat thoughts, any kind of judging and condemning of yourself, means that you're taking it personally. And you are causing yourself pain. You got a choice. You can do it or not. You want to beat yourself up? Sure. I've, I've threatened some people that I want to get some boxing gloves so they can do it really good. But it's not needed. You have to understand, every distraction that arises is your teacher. 
You don't fight with it. You look at it and you say, okay, this distraction, I'm identifying with it. How to let go of that? Use the six R's. And do it with a light mind. If you've done meditation with other teachers, they have a tendency to have you really try hard and push the hindrances away. It doesn't work. The hindrances are showing you where you're taking everything personally and how you are causing your own pain. The essence of Buddha's, the Buddha's practice is changing your perspective from I am that to it's only that. The fastest way that I know of to let go of a hindrance is to laugh. Isn't that odd? How many meditation teachers have you told you told you you need to laugh while you're sitting? <laughs> One. <laughs> but when you laugh with yourself, I don't mean necessarily laugh out loud, but when you laugh, at how crazy your mind can be for taking this personally and wanting to know more and more and more and analyze all of these things, you're causing yourself problems. You're causing yourself pain. So the Buddha's practice is about changing your perspective and seeing that this is part of a process all the time, and it happens fast. <clears throat> it happens, and it gets bigger and bigger as, as it keeps coming up. You won't see the first, the first part of uh, depend, the links of dependent origination until you get to a place where your mind is very quiet. You will get to that stage if you follow the directions the way they're given. Don't get caught up in telling yourself, I don't know, I, wanna, I have to ask somebody, I have to talk about it. No, you don't. You have to do the practice. You have to six R. You don't give any but, but. That's why I don't allow that word. Don't use that word with me. I will scold you if you do. Every time you say but, you're saying my opinion's more important than what you're telling me. And what I'm telling you is the Dhamma. That's the way it works. So every time something comes up and it pulls your attention away from your object of meditation, that is teaching you where at some time in the past you took that thing personally and now it's coming up and now you get a chance to actually get in harmony with it and let it go. Too many times, I've, I've read a lot of books on, on overcoming hindrances, and they like to wor use words like fight and suppress and push down. And that isn't the way you let go of a hindrance. You let go of a hindrance by seeing it not keeping your attention on it, not taking it personally, 
relax that tension and tightness. Let go of that craving. And then, one of the things, well, let me step back a minute. One of the things that some people do when they have a hindrance arise, they say, well, I release and relax and release and relax, and it doesn't go away. Of course it's not going to go away. You're taking half a formula and wanting to be successful with it. Doesn't work. You got to do the whole thing. Right effort is noticing when something unwholesome pulls your attention away. What's unwholesome? I am that. Taking it personally. That's always what is unwholesome. The second part of right effort is releasing it not keeping your attention on it and relaxing. The rest of right effort is about bringing up something wholesome. What is wholesome? Smiling. Staying with your object of meditation. And you stay with your object of meditation for as long as you can. That's right effort. I know that there is a lot of and I did it for almost 20 years, vipassana, watch it until it goes away. That's not right effort. Right effort is recognizing that that's there and don't keep your attention on it. If you keep your attention on it, you're feeding that hindrance, that distraction. And it will get bigger and more intense. And I, I had the instructions when I was practicing straight vipassana. If you get a pain in your body, put your attention right in the middle of that pain and see its true nature. Guess what? It makes that pain bigger and more intense. And you're not seeing its true nature. They tell you, you see its true nature by if it's uh, the earth element or uh, hardness and softness or movement and vibration or heat or cool, whatever. The true nature is that it's there and don't feed it. Don't put your attention on it. If you keep your attention on a distraction, it will last for a long time. It will cause immeasurable suffering to you. And you don't have a chance to let it go. Why? Because you keep feeding it. So it'll come back. Bigger, more intense, no need. You don't need to do that. When you see that your mind is distracted and pulled away, just let it be there by itself. Don't keep your attention on it. Now put your attention on relaxing. And then put your attention on smiling. And then put your attention on coming back to your object of meditation and keep your attention going with that object of meditation. That's immediately effective, isn't it? That's the way it's supposed to work. But anybody that tells you that you have to keep your attention on one thing, they're not practicing the Eightfold Path. You see, when you're practicing the six R's, you're practicing the entire Eightfold Path at that time. When a hindrance arises and you treat it in the same way, it's helping you to improve your mindfulness. 
It's helping your observation power of how this process works. And it really does work very nicely. So that any time a hindrance arises, welcome it. Don't try to push it away. Don't try to force it to be something else. It's there. That's the truth. You can't fight with the truth. Doesn't work. Causes suffering. So don't fight with it. Allow it to be there. Relax into it. Smile. Laugh with it. See, when you laugh at how you get caught by your uh, hindrances, when you laugh with that, you go from, let's say, anger. I'm mad. I don't like this. And you laugh. All of a sudden, your mind says, oh, it's only this anger. It's not even mine. I didn't ask it to come up. Do I want to hold on to it or not? Let it go. So that changes your perspective from I am that and I'm trying to control it, and I'm trying to make it go away, to it's only that. Oh, don't need to have that hanging around. And that's how you start purifying your mind. So welcome the hindrances when they come. Don't fight with them. Ah, my teacher's here. Okay. I'm not your teacher. Isn't that odd? I'm a guide. I'll talk to you starting tomorrow, every day, just making sure that you're staying on the path. But you're your own teacher. Whatever you do with what arises in the present moment, if you use the six R's and come back to your object of meditation, you're teaching yourself a couple of different lessons. One of the lessons is that this is impersonal. Every thought, every feeling, every sensation is impersonal. It's not me, it's not mine. I don't have control over it. It comes up by itself. Close your eyes, open your eyes. What do you see? Oh, that happened by itself, didn't it? You're seeing consciousness arose by itself. It's not you, it's not yours, it's impersonal. Everything in this world is impersonal every mental thing, every physical thing. It's all impersonal. And when you start using the six R's more and more, you start seeing that more and more clearly. And this is what insight is all about. You start seeing this more as a process, not something to get involved with or try to control but you will see more and more clearly, yeah, this is part of a process, and it's not mine. When you use the six R's, you are developing what the Buddha called wisdom's eye. <coughs> what does that mean? It means that you're seeing in the present moment without any distraction. That's what wisdom's eye is. And you're not taking anything personally. As you start to go deeper in your practice, at first it's not going to be like that, but as you start going from one jhana to the next jhana to the next jhana, you are starting to see more and more clearly how this is true. 
Jhana is a Pali word, and it's completely misunderstood. Almost everybody says jhana is deep absorption concentration. According to the Buddha, it is a level of your understanding. I don't make a big deal out of what jhana you're in. Most of the time I won't tell you because it doesn't matter. I'm looking at your understanding and how you start to get insights. So it's a real interesting process that you're going through with the jhana practice. Almost everybody, I mean, when they get into jhana, all of a sudden they have this pride thing. I'm in a jhana. I was in Korea and this this lady wasn't following directions very well and I started scolding her. And she said, I've been meditating for 10 years. I'm in the fourth jhana. And I went, so? You don't know what you're doing. You're practicing one-pointed concentration. You're not developing your insight knowledge at all. And you're slowing down your progress with that pride. So I don't, I don't really want to tell you what jhana you're in because it doesn't really matter. What matters is your understanding of how this whole thing that we call life is part of a process. As you get better at recognizing it, you naturally become more content. Your mind becomes more at ease. You have more equanimity. You may have more balance in your life. You don't have the roller coaster rides of, I'm happy, I'm sad. I'm happy, I'm sad. It starts to be little waves. You still go through some hassles but you don't take them so personally. You don't say, this is my problem and I have to do something about it. I have to change. No, it's, it's a problem, okay. I'm driving my car down the road and I get a flat tire. Does it help any if I get emotional about it? Does it make this job easier to take care of when I get caught up in emotion? Liking and disliking? No. When you have balance in your mind, I got a flat tire. Okay, what needs to be done? Got to go fix it. Okay. So you stop getting so caught up and distracted with your likes and dislikes. It's just part of life. Some things are a lot easier to handle than others. But having equanimity and seeing how your mind is handling it and using the six R's is the key. That is exactly what the Buddha was talking about when he was talking about meditation. Now, again, I didn't see a whole lot of people smiling today, and I checked. And I'm telling you right now, if you want to progress fast, I'm not kidding. You smile all the time. I don't care what you're doing, you smile. Your progress in the meditation will just start zooming. Why? They've done studies at the University of Minnesota on the corners of your mouth. When the corners of your mouth go down, so does your mental state. When the corners of your mouth go up, so does your mental state. 
it's important to have a light mind, a mind that has fun doing this. Don't make it a task that has to be done. It's not work. It's a game. Play with it. If it doesn't happen the way you, you think it should, laugh with it. Because your mind is just being attached. Your mind is saying, oh, it's a not supposed to be like that. Well, what is it like? There's no shoulds and shouldn'ts. There is, this is the way it is. What are you going to do with it? Now, a lot of people, they, they hear about hindrances, but they don't recognize that the hindrances, they arise all the time in your daily activities. It's not just about sitting. It's about watching your mind. That's one of the, the real problems that doing one-pointed concentration causes. And that includes straight vipassana, because it is a one-pointed kind of concentration. They say it's moment to moment. But you get to a certain level of, of the concentration and it suppresses the hindrances. The force of the concentration pushes the hindrances down. As a result, when you lose that concentration, the hindrances come up in your daily activities and you get caught. And it's even stronger. And you're not able to recognize these hindrances because the force of the concentration stopped them from arising. That's why the Buddha put in that relaxed step. The relaxed step has to be intentional. You have to intentionally relax the tightness in your head. How do you do that? Notice that the tightness is there and let go of the, relax into it. You know how to relax when you start to get problems in your, in your body, it tenses up, and then you say, oh, why don't I just relax that? You know how to relax. When I first came back from Burma, I'd spent two years doing straight vipassana and I was very successful. But it didn't seem right. There was something that was wrong. And when I came back to Asia, in, in Asia, I went to Malaysia, and they really, really wanted me to teach meditation because they knew I'd been away so long doing the meditation. And I couldn't teach straight Vipassana because I didn't believe in it. So I started teaching uh, loving-kindness meditation. Now in, in Malaysia, third of the population is Malay, third is Chinese, third is Indian, from India. And the Malay run the government. And that really gets the Chinese, they don't like that idea because they're really ambitious and basically the Malay are not. They, they're kind of laid back. And it frustrates the, uh, the Chinese. So they're walking around being angry all the time. And that's who I was mostly teaching in, in Malaysia was the Chinese. And I'm seeing they're, they're being angry and they're taking it out on their families and they're fighting with each other and having all these kind of problems. So I decided to start teaching them loving kindness meditation. And they started mellowing out. 
and they started recognizing how incredibly caught they were in their hindrances, in their opinions and ideas and identifying with all of these things and causing themselves so much suffering. After a short period of time, people would go out and they would do a month Vipassana retreat and they would start to get very judgmental, harsh, hard minds that didn't see hindrances. And they would come running to me. When are you going to give your next retreat? Why is that? Because what I was teaching them was how to recognize hindrances, how to let go of the hindrances, how to soften the mind. And you soften the mind. That's, that's a word that I used very often. Be softer with it. But people were not understanding it until I picked up a copy of this and I started reading the suttas to the people. And all of a sudden they were getting what I was saying. And the progress in the meditation really took off. And it says tranquilize in the sutta, but they weren't understanding what tranquilize meant, so I said relax. And they got it. They really understood. This is something you intentionally have to do, is relax. It's letting go of that tension and tightness. It's not just softening that, it's letting it go. So, after a period of time, these people were going to work and their workmates were saying, I'm, you're changing, what are you doing? You're doing something different. You don't get mad like you used to. And they said, oh, we're just doing a little bit of meditation, you know. But they started changing their world around them by softening their mind, by relaxing that craving, by letting go, and coming back to smiling and your object of meditation. One of the real advantages of practicing metta is you can do it all the time. I don't care whether you're working or not. Oh, I gotta be serious with my job. Can you smile at the same time? When your mind has joy in it, your intuition is much better. And it's fun. This is a practice that's not just sitting practice. I just got through writing a book. <coughs> it's called Life is Meditation, Meditation is Life. It's 24-7, your meditation. Too many times people do meditation and then they, they get up and they forget all about the meditation and just act the way they always acted. Well, you, you start running into walls when you do that. And you start hurting a lot more because you're not being mindful all the time. You need to be able to watch what you're doing and see what's causing your pain. Again, this is not the blame game. You can't blame somebody else for your pain. It's what you're doing with your own mind. One of the big mistakes that happens with meditation is people are really, really judgmental about the things that they do. And they start 
coming down on themselves. They start bringing up the hindrances purposefully. Oh, I really blew that one. I made a mistake. If this is a game, okay, you made a mistake. Don't do it again. If it causes pain to you or pain to anybody else around you, don't do that again. It's that simple. But if it makes you happy and it makes everybody else around you happy, well, guess what? Do it over and over again. That's how you develop your personality. So that you don't have such a critical mind. So, so that you don't have a negative mind. Now this is developing your mindfulness so you can see how this process works. What happens first? Well, a feeling comes up. What happens after that? Well, craving comes up, tension and tightness. What happens after that? My nonsense mind comes up. And it really is a nonsense mind. You're judging and condemning and all of this kind of stuff. It's unwholesome. And you cause yourself pain. And you cause other people pain. But being mindful means seeing, oh, I did that, and this is how it worked. Let's watch a little bit more closely and see how this really is the road to happiness. The road to peace. So many people are caught up in world peace. Oh, I want the world to be peaceful. Uh, starts at home. You have to do it here, in yourself. You have to be able to recognize these hindrances that pull your attention away and have all of these judgments and conde condemnations and proliferations and just, it is nonsense thoughts. There is no sense to it. So you need to use the six R's not only while you're sitting and while you're walking, you need to use the six R's when you are eating, going to the toilet, taking a shower, walking from here to your car, to your job, using that in your job. There's no time when you can't be mindful and watch how your mind works. Watch how it reacts. Well, I don't like that. Who doesn't like it? Who's caught in their craving? Who's identifying with it? This is me, this is mine, this is who I am, and I'm special. No. It's just false belief. The whole point of the Buddha's practice is learning how to change. And learning how to change so that you make things better and easier for yourself. And that in turn helps everybody else to be better and easier. You have to be the example. So many people come to me and they say, I want to teach this stuff. How do you teach it? You be the example. You show other people with all kinds of situations in life how to have this balanced mind. How to not get caught up in the emotional upsets and the identification and the pain that you cause yourself. Hindrances are your teacher. 
because they're showing you where your attachment is, where you're identifying with it. So that way, you can let it be, you can relax, smile, and bring up something wholesome. The more you stay with your wholesome object, the more uplifted your mind becomes. Why do I want you to smile all the time? Because you start to have a joyful mind. And a joyful mind is very alert. And your observation power is very quick. Because you can see when you start to lose it. So smiling is a key ingredient in becoming more alert. It's a key ingredient in being happy while you're doing other things. I mean, the Buddha, many times, he talks about <coughs> wise attention, wisdom, develop your wisdom. Before I became a Buddhist, I used to go to this one church and this minister would get up and he would give a rousing talk on you got to be wise. You have to develop your wisdom. And just as he was getting, I'm, I'm going, okay, now tell me how to do it. I'm ready. And then he quit. Well, <laughs> now I get to tell you how to do it. And it works. Have fun. Don't get serious with yourself. Every time you get serious with yourself, guess who has some craving in their mind? Every time you have repeat thoughts, guess who has craving in their mind? Who's causing their pain? You're doing it to yourself. Oh, it's their fault because they said this. <laughs> Who cares what they said? Really? It's just their wandering mind trying to attack my wandering mind. <laughs> so you use your six R's and it's okay, you can say that. Not necessarily true. But I don't care. It doesn't matter. That's your opinion. That's your wandering mind, your proliferation of mind, that it doesn't have anything to do with the reality of how things work. And the way things work is very simple. I've just, I've told you this three or four times already in this talk. It's very simple. A feeling arises, then there's craving, then there's clinging, then there's your emotional dissatisfaction, habitual tendency. Well, every time they say it this in this way, I'm going to act this way. If they have their anger and they throw their anger at me, I'm going to take my anger and throw it back at them. Does that lead to your happiness and well-being? Or does that lead to your suffering? And your repeat thoughts. I said this, they said that, I should have said this to that no good so-and-so. I'm right, they're wrong. And then it happens again, just like it's on a tape deck. Exactly the same words, exactly the same order. When you see that happening, that's the time to laugh. My mind's crazy now. You know, a lot of accidents occur because they, people get caught up in thinking something and they're not paying attention to what they're doing while they do it. And then they'll say, well, I don't know why that happened. 
I just backed up into a tree. I didn't see the tree. Well, of course not. You were thinking. You weren't driving. So to be able to be friends with your hindrance and just recognize that they're there to teach you a lesson in where your attachment is and it's by its coming up, it's helping you to be more mindful so you can let it go. And that helps purify your mind. And you have to do it often. Somebody says, well, okay, I'll do it. How long do I have to do it? <laughs> well, when you get up to five million, we'll consider letting you go. Five million times you can do it. And count them. <laughs> so, Don't treat sloth and torpor as your enemy. Don't treat restlessness as your enemy. Don't treat the I want mind as your enemy. Or I don't want mind as your enemy. Or I don't know. I don't know. <coughs> If you're doing the practice by using the six R's and smiling and staying on your object of meditation, you're doing it right. Don't get into old habits of saying, but I want to know more. I don't understand this. Well, do it. Don't be talking about it. Do it. Doubt will disappear unless you get involved with it and take it personally and say, I want to know more. I don't, I want, I want. Well, isn't that two hindrances? It's doubt and lust. I want it. See, hindrances don't arise one at a time. They kind of like to gang up on you and beat you around a little bit. It's kind of like a kick them when they're down. So you're going to have this. And restlessness. Restlessness and sloth and torpor are going to be around until you're an arahat. So you better get used to them and recognize them. Restlessness is a painful feeling. And it's the one that you're going to probably experience the most because that has to do with your thinking about this and thinking about that and getting caught up in your mental proliferations. I started really liking that word. Because that's what it is. I mean, you're just letting your mind think what it wants to think, when it wants to think it, without realizing that it's mostly nonsense stuff. <coughs> so, the more you practice smiling, the better your mindfulness becomes. The better your mindfulness becomes, the easier it is to see how hindrances arise and how to let them go. <coughs> Mindfulness has to be sharp. There's no getting around it. And every level of your meditation, your mindfulness is much better. <coughs> So all of this stuff is interconnected, you know? <coughs> One of
one of the problems with a lot of commentaries on the Buddha's teaching is that they take one small thing and make it into a big thing and it seems like it's a separation. But everything I've been talking about right now is interconnected. And it all comes from smiling and using the six R's. That pulls everything in together and it helps you very much to be more alert and see for yourself how you cause your own pain. So you can change and you can benefit not only while you're sitting. You start benefiting always in life. And it makes life a lot more fun. <laughs> I'd like to get a hold of the guy that told us that we're supposed to be serious. Life is serious. I'd like to shoot that guy. <laughs> no, life is supposed to be fun. When you were three or four years old, did you have fun? Yeah, sometimes you fell down, you cried for a minute, got up, and then started having fun again. Well, what's the difference between then and now? Well, I have all these responsibilities. So? Can't you have fun with responsibilities? If you can't, you're in the wrong profession. If you can't have fun with what you're doing while you're doing it, then start looking for a different job. Really. Because it's not worth drudgery because I have to have this much money to live on. But if you can't have fun with what you're doing while you're doing it and laugh with things, not at things, it seems to me that that's a wasted life. Live simply. Don't have to live in an, in an exorbitant way. The way that they measured their wealth during the time of the Buddha was not how much they hoarded, <clears throat> but how much they gave. And if you were reasonably well off, You'd put up a little stand in front of your house and you would give food away to anybody that came along. Didn't matter who it was. And if you were super wealthy, then you did that five different places in the city. At each gate, because there was a gate north, south, east, west, and at your house. And you were considered very wealthy when you did that. These days, it's uh, the idea of hoarding is the most popular. Well, if I don't have a million dollars in the bank, I'm poor or whatever. As you practice giving your smile and your happy feelings away to other people, you become prosperous. It's not a maybe. When you get stingy, then you start getting into lack. But when you're giving, and giving happy thoughts and happy feelings and saying things that make other people feel good. <coughs> you're affecting the world around you in a positive way and you're noticing when hindrances come up more easily and you're more willing to let go of those hindrances. So, 
don't fight with your hindrances. Don't try to control them. Don't try to change them or make them be something other than they are. Allow the hindrance to be there. Just don't keep your attention on it. Relax. Smile. Come back to your object of meditation. Give your loving and kind thoughts to yourself and your spiritual friend. And have fun doing it. Do it with a light mind. One of the problems with one-pointed concentration is you have a tendency to get a serious mind. And a serious mind is a mind that uh, doesn't have strong mindfulness in it. It has weak mindfulness in it. Of course, that depends on what your definition of mindfulness is. But your observation power is not near as lucid or clear because you keep getting caught up in the restlessness and the nonsense and the proliferation and all these distractions. Most people don't really notice that they have a body because they're so caught up in their thoughts until they happen to bump into something or there's something in your body that doesn't work very well, then you start noticing it a little bit. <clears throat> but when you use that relaxed step, you are noticing what's happening in your body. Now, you have this meninges that goes around the brain. It goes all the way down, all around the uh, spinal cord. So when you relax that, you're learning to relax your entire body. And when you relax your entire body, circulation is better. You get more healthy. When every time you have a thought, that meninges tightens a little bit. So, relax. Over a period of time, I've had a lot of people that when they start meditation, they start complaining about their back is so sore, their knees are so sore. And I try to get them to be as comfortable as they can be. And uh, then they'll get to a certain place in the meditation and they say, I don't have any more pain. Why? Because they let go of their painful attachments. Okay? So I've been talking for a long time. Do you have any questions? Yeah. What's the, what's the interaction of the posture and the realization? <coughs> the interaction of the posture and the relaxation. I don't quite understand what you're asking. Yes, it is. So that's great. Um, but there's, there's a trade-off there, it seems like, with relaxation. Is the well, you, you, you sit so that your, your vertebrae are one on top of the other. Okay? And when you do that and you're not leaning hard into the seat, uh, you'll find that your mind is much more clear. And there will be times that your, your back will just all of a sudden get super straight. And it's, it's like your mind is really, really alert and bright and you're able to stay on your object of meditation. <clears throat> Sit comfortably straight. Okay? And you'll, you'll find that your meditation moves along better when you're doing that. Sometimes people will get a little bit too comfortable and they will have a lot of sloth and torpor. Sit a little bit straighter. And when you start losing that, you'll notice it more quickly and you can sit straighter again. 
That's why yesterday I was talking about taking a towel and wrapping it in, in a bolt behind and put it in the small of your back so that you're not leaning heavily. Which one first? Okay. Uh, Dante, I was noticing today in relaxing that my brain actually seemed like it was spasming, like it, that it was like not, and it didn't quite want to let go. Okay. In the six hour process. That's okay. You just relax one time. You don't relax, 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 relax. Don't push it. Don't push it. Okay. Your mind will go back to that distraction. You get to do it again. Over a short period of time, your mind will stop doing that and it, it will become oh, much, yeah. Okay. Um, today, when I was trying to um, observe the how, my mind didn't seem spacious enough and it would go into mental proliferation. So I would just release it and then relax and come back. You'll see how as you go deeper, it's a natural process. You don't have to push, and that's what that's what you were doing. You're you're trying a little bit too hard. Just stay with your object of meditation, and all things will become clear as as time goes by. <coughs> yeah. So wisdom's understanding the links of dependent origination. Yes. Well, you have to have a mind that is pure, sila, keeping your precepts. And you need a mind that is very collected and alert and composed to be able to see the, uh, the links of dependent origination. And that will happen naturally. This is not something you have to push. Okay. Dante, building on what Victoria asked, I was experiencing maybe three hindrances at the same time. Oh, time. yeah. And so um, in the relaxed step, I would, uh, I would release, but then I noticed that maybe my release was kind of a little push because I was focusing or on the part of your instruction where you say that the mind becomes very bright and very pure. Going back to the object of yeah. For that to happen. Well, or but you're happen. you're thinking it's going to happen in a particular way, and it's not that way. Can you can you talk about should you go back to the object of meditation? Absolutely. With the That's it, and, and the distraction will come up again, and you'll do it again. You might have to have it come back fifteen or twenty times before it actually. Let's go. And that's okay. The importance of smiling, I can't overstate, because when you have that smile in your mind, your mind is light and very alert, and you don't get caught up in trying so hard, putting in too much energy. See, one of the parts of, of the awakening factors is energy. And you want to be in balance with your energy as much as you can. And when you try too hard, it's going to make your mind restless. You don't try quite hard enough, it's going to make your mind dull. So you have to learn to adjust, but little bits at a time. Not this, oh, I'm sloth and torpor, and then sit up real straight. No, 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 no. That's not the way it's going to go. You have to <clears throat> observe more clearly how you're staying on your object of meditation. And then you six are the thoughts, those little tiny thoughts that turn into dreams and turn into all these other things. You have to be able to observe how that happens. But you might have to do it a lot of times before you actually get an insight into how it happens. So be patient. 
The, one of the things that used to drive me crazy when Usilanando was still around, he had a favorite expression for me. Patience leads to Nibbana. Drove me crazy. <laughs> I'll be patient as long as I can do it now. Yeah, that does help. Do you want to keep that? Do you want to keep that unwholesome state or not? So can you say we see things as it is, so we don't control? Who said that you can't change? Do you want to stay the same or you want to be different? You have to learn how to do it so that you can change for yourself. You want to keep that unwholesome state or you want to develop a wholesome state? You still have a choice of what to do. And you still, when you use the six R's, you're still seeing in the present moment how it works. Okay. <clears throat> I had a, a uh, poly scholar and he really studied the suttas a lot. And he said, nowhere in the suttas, in Pali, is there mentioned the present moment. It's just the present. Because you can't, you, you see the present moment, it's gone before you can recognize it. So it's just the present. Okay, what you see, in the present dictates what happens in the future. So you use you use the six R's so that you can change for the wholesome. Okay. I noticed when I would put a wholesome <coughs> thought in my chest, in my heart, if I put it on too strong and try too hard. <laughs> Right. And I was I was playing today with just having to be less strong, not the blowtorch. Right. Something less, and now I can hold it a little longer. Is that right? That's fine, and you need to smile a lot more. <laughs> that's really true. You'll learn how to balance the amount of energy you need to do this by smiling. <coughs> and every time you smile, you're practicing the entire Eightfold Path. Isn't that nice? I don't care whether you're faking it or not. <laughs> okay. And and the reason I say this is I, I read a, a, an article about smiling. 
and they said, even when you don't feel like smiling and you're painting it on, your mind starts to look at your face and say, well, you're smiling. I'm, I guess I should be happy now. <laughs> so I don't care whether you're faking it or not. I really don't. Smile anyway. Smile. Yeah. When you said that the smile will guide how much energy like the, the regulation You'll learn how to how to adjust your energy. As you go deeper in the meditation, you have to learn how to adjust little tiny bits at a time just so that you can be in harmony with your with your balance of of staying with your object of meditation so how will the smile show that to you improves your mindfulness doesn't it makes your mind light so you can see when you're pushing Okay. It's awful quiet on this side of the room. Can I have a question? Okay. Um, Sandy is uh, talking about the letting go of the painful feeling, the pain we can carry in. And we don't, we feel that we don't have any pain. So Sometimes it happens that way. Sometimes it doesn't. It doesn't matter. As you let go of pain in your mind, you let go of pain in your body, too. But is it the process of purification? Of course it is. So, I'm thinking that this means um, in the mind is one thing, and you're sending it yourself, and in the body it's something else, and you're saying that. No. Uh, they're, they're interconnected. See, when you when you let go of that tightness in your head, you're letting go of physical, and it also lets go of the. <sighs> Interesting question, isn't it? <laughs> Well, it's everybody's mind has their own experiences. In that way, they're uh, it's it's colored by <coughs> past experiences, and that goes even back into past lives. Okay, so in in a way. Yes, you're right. But it is an interesting... You have to be able to integrate it. Yes. Did the Buddha say there are, um, we have six senses, or did that come in the car? Oh, that's... The Buddha said that in a lot of suttas. You have eyes, you have ears, you have nose, you have tongue, you have... Uh, <laughs> no, the tangibles, and you have mind. Uh, the internal six sense doors are the actual organ themselves, the eye, the ear, the nose, the tongue, the body, and mind. <coughs> the external are the seeing. So it's the, uh, the projection out, or the hearing, or the smelling, or tasting, or touching, or thinking. 
Those are called external sense doors. Yeah? It seems that uh, when I watch craving, it's so subtle. It even tries to control my meditation. Oh, of course. Welcome to the human race. <laughs> but it's always there. Not always, but a lot of the times. After you six are, it's not. So you get a brief, brief moment. But you will be able to develop your mind to such a degree that you'll be able to sit for long periods of time, an hour, hour and a half, without having any craving arise. Now this is a real deep state. It's not going to happen right at first. But when you get into neither perception nor non-perception, you'll, you'll be able to sit without anything happening. What relief that is. And I expect a lot of you on this retreat to be able to experience that. See what kind of confidence I have in you? Yeah. Is that a state where you're not really asleep because you're awake? And That's right. It's like being asleep and being awake at the same time, or being aware at the same time. That's why they call it neither perception nor non-perception, because it's, it's the real, real subtle little things. And this is where you'll, you'll start to be able to see the individual links of dependent origination. You're not going to necessarily recognize them as that, but you're going to be able to see the disturbance caused by that. Can you smile while you're on the computer? Can you have fun when you're on the computer? You're doing it right. <laughs> oh, your mindfulness is still the same. It's still the six R's. But it is every time you smile you're practicing the Eightfold Path. And I'll get into that later. <coughs> and you better start having fun or I'm going to get out my feather and start tickling you. <laughs> See how your mind feels when you, when you laugh? Isn't that nice? That's the kind of mind I want you to develop. A mind that's light. You don't have to be serious about anything. You can be light with it. You can be happy with it. And that's the whole point of doing this. Letting go of suffering. Letting go of those old habits of being serious and worrying and not liking this and not liking that. Well, you cause yourself a lot of suffering by doing that. You can do it. Smile and accept. Doesn't, doesn't hurt when you do that. Be happy. Have that light mind. Laugh with things. I mean, sometimes I see a butterfly and I start laughing just because it makes me happy. <coughs> okay? Anything else? Then let's share some merit. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we've thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours 
May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.